Hi, and welcome to your YouTube page. My name is Emily. And my name is Courtney. And for this week's My Favorite Verse, it's coming to us from somebody who talks to us all the time, but he's actually never said what his favorite verse is. Mm -hmm. Now with Pastor John. Well, I want to welcome you to Providence Church Online. My name is John, and we are thrilled that you have made the decision to tune in this morning. If you are new with us, we are wrapping up a series called My Favorite Verse. However, before we get to our text, I want to tell you about a couple of things that are happening next week. Next week, we are kicking off a brand new series called Anchors. Everybody say Anchors. Uh, for five weeks, we're going to talk about living with confident hope in a chaotic world. And the reason for this series is because the longer this pandemic goes, the more the stress levels go up, the more uncertain life seems to be, the more that we are going to need to anchor our lives to the solid truth found in God's Word. So I hope that you will tune in and join us next week for this brand new series. At the same time, we're going to be launching something called house churches. And I'm so excited about house churches because even though we can't meet all together in a building right now, we are going to do the next best thing. We're going to give some of you the chance to meet together in homes. Now, currently we have four homes that are going to be open. There's one in Sugarland, one in Katy, one in Richmond, and one in Stafford. And so if you would like to gather with a few members from the church to watch the Sunday morning service together, you can let us know by filling out the form that's located on our homepage. That said, I don't want anyone to feel like they have to do this. And so if you're not ready to take this step, that's not a problem. I completely understand. I'm just going to encourage you to continue watching online and staying connected with our church family that way. Well, as I said, we are wrapping up a series called My Favorite Verse. And what I want to do is share with you one verse that I have prayed over my children since they were little. I know that most of our kids are going to be going back to school next week. I know that most of them will be doing so online. And so I want to use this week to pray over all of our children as well as encourage all of our parents and teachers who are going to be doing their best to lead our kids through the next school semester. So if you got your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them up to Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to find our verse for today. If you don't have a Bible, you can download our digital listening guide or you can simply follow along on the screen. But this is our verse today. It comes from Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and it says this. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Now, real quick, I want to give you a little background to this verse. The book of Luke is a biography of the life of Jesus. Uh, the first two chapters of the book of Luke cover the first 12 years of Jesus's life. But in chapter three, the book jumps forward about 18 years. So we don't really get a clear picture of what it would have been like for Jesus as an adolescent or a young adult. But we do find out about his birth and we find out about something that happened at 12 years of age. In fact, something happened at the end of chapter two that would have been any parent's worst nightmare. When Jesus was 12 years old, he traveled with his mother and father to Jerusalem in order to celebrate the Passover. Now, the Passover was a really big deal. It was like the 4th of July and Thanksgiving all rolled up into one. And so people from all over Israel would have made the trip to the city of Jerusalem. Now, because Jesus was from a small town called Nazareth, the trip would have been roughly 64 miles one way. Okay, I want you to think about that for just a second. That would have been a 128 miles round trip without a car. They would have walked the entire trip. Of course, the roads would have been packed with families making the same trip. And so when it was time for Jesus to return home, Mary and Joseph gave Jesus permission to walk back with some of his friends, or at least that's what I think they did, because at some point on the journey at home, Mary and Joseph realized something. They realized that Jesus was missing. Je Jesus was nowhere to be found. I mean, he wasn't with any of their friends. He wasn't with any of their family members. Jesus was gone. And so they did what any of us would have done. They began to retrace their steps all the way back to Jerusalem. And when they finally did find Jesus, they found him in all places. They found him in the temple. 
At 12 years old, they found Jesus teaching the teachers of the law. And the text tells us that everyone was amazed by what they heard from Jesus. Of course, Mary and Joseph were far from amazed. And instead, I think they were probably a little bit upset with Jesus. But I want you to listen to how Jesus responds to his parents in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 49. It says this, Why were you searching for me? Jesus asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they, that would be Mary and Joseph, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Now, I love this passage for a couple of different reasons. First of all, I love this passage because it's a great reminder that parenting is not easy. I mean, if God handpicked Mary and Joseph to raise Jesus, you you would think that they would have some kind of clue about being parents. But according to Luke chapter 2, there were some things that they did not understand. By the way, How many of you who are parents know that there are just some things about raising kids that you don't ever understand? I mean, no matter how many books you read, no no matter how, how much you prepare, there are going to be some times when even the best parents don't know what to do. And so I love this passage because it's honest, right? It's honest. We, we, we catch very early on that parenting is not easy, but I love this passage for another reason. And that's the the reason that we find in in, in the verse that we're focusing in today. That would be verse 52. We actually find the secret for raising kids. You see, even when we don't understand, even when we don't get it right, our kids can still grow to become the people that God wants them to be. Now, I've entitled today's message, Winning at Parenting, and I like that title because most of us know, most of us understand what winning looks like. For example, to win in sports, it's all about scoring more points than your opponent. To win at business, it's all about making a profit and keeping the customer happy. To win in education, you simply have to master a topic or earn a degree. But when it comes to parenting, we don't always know what winning looks like. I mean, how would, how would you know? How would I know if I was winning as a parent? The, the reason I, I ask that question is because winning can be defined differently by different people. For instance, some parents... Uh, for them, winning could be defined as just raising kids who, who always get selected for the gifted and talented group at school. For, for other parents, winning could be defined as raising kids who never get in trouble and always do the right thing. And for still more parents, winning could be defined as raising kids who are not still living at home when they're 35. Can I get an amen on that one right there? So, so with so many definitions out there, what, what does it mean to win at parenting? Well, the best way to answer that question is not to go with what I think. It's not to go with what the world thinks. Instead, the best way to answer that question is to go with what God thinks. And fortunately, Luke chapter 2, verse 52 gives us some insight into what winning looks like. And so let me just go back to that key verse that we're using today, our theme verse today, Luke 2, 52. This is God's perspective on winning as a parent. Basically, this describes Jesus. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. You you want to know what winning looks like? Here it is right here. When our kids are growing in these three areas. Now, for those of you who who, who don't know, Irene and I have five children. Uh, One of them is 26 years old. He just had a birthday. He's out living on his own. The other four that we have, they're between the ages of 19 and 20, believe believe it or not. Uh, Those four are still in college. Uh, But even though our kids are older, uh, we are still parenting. And and even though we didn't always get everything right when they were young, we still don't get everything right even now. But, But one of the things I think that Irene and I did get right is that we prayed for them over and over and over again throughout their lives. In fact, early on, I made the decision to pray Luke chapter 2, verse 52 over their lives. I just prayed that they would grow in wisdom and stature and favor. I would pray that over them nonstop. And the reason I did this is because I didn't know if they were going to do well in school or not. I didn't know if they were going to be super talented or not. 
but I always believed if they would grow up to be like Jesus, if they would grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men, then no matter what they did with their lives, no matter where they went in the world, they would always be in good company. And and so for years, I have prayed this verse over their lives, but it's not just enough to to pray for our kids. It's not enough just to pray for our kids. Yes, God will do his part when we pray, but we have to do our part as well. And so beyond praying this verse, I have three, you know, out of this verse, I have three kind of broader goals that I want to share with you. Uh, These are goals that I would like to see come to fruition in my kids' lives. And, and, and by the way, because, because you're a part of this church, th- these aren't just goals for my kids. These are, these are goals for each one of our kids in the church and, and maybe even for some of you as well. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you three parenting goals. Uh, these are three prayers that I pray over my kids uh, each and every day. Here, here would be prayer number one. My first goal would be that my kids would love God more than anything else in life. That's my big goal, right? That my kids would love God more than anything else in life. Now, one thing I've noticed about children is that oftentimes they grow up loving the same thing that their parents love. Have you noticed this? I mean, not, not all the time. It's not, not 100% guaranteed. But, but very often, children will grow up loving the exact same thing their parents love. I mean, I mean think about it. If a parent loves decorating for Christmas, chances are kid, uh, chances are good that the kids are going to grow up loving decorating the house for Christmas. If a, if a child grows up where, where mom loves listening to R and B music, well, chances are good the kids are going to grow up loving R and B music. Or, or if a parent loves Texas A and M, there's a good chance that the kids are going to grow up loving. Texas A&M too, which is just wrong because we all know that truly spiritual people love the University of Oklahoma way more than Texas A&M. Can, can I get an amen on that one right there? Well, one of our biggest responsibilities as parents is to help our kids fall in love with God more than anything else in this life. We, we want our kids to fall in love with God more than anything else in life. So let me give you a couple of verses that help us to understand why this is so important. The first one comes from Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, one of the religious leaders was trying to trap Jesus. And so he asked Jesus this question. He said, Jesus, what is the greatest command in, in all the law? And the text tells us exactly how Jesus responded. It says this, Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest command. Now, I have no idea why this question would have been a trap for Jesus, uh, because everybody would have known the correct answer. In fact, the answer went all the way back to the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when God gave this exact command to Moses. But here's what I want you to notice about Jesus' response. Jesus did not say we are to love God with a little bit of our heart, soul, and mind. He didn't say that, did he? Jesus didn't even say we are to love God with the majority of our heart, soul, and mind. No, no, no. What did Jesus say? Jesus said we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. So why is that? I mean, why should we love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind? Well, for starters... We should do so because God did the same for us. I mean, we we should hold nothing back from God because God has held nothing back from us. I I mean, think about it. God loved us. God cared about us. And God sent his only son to this earth to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could have a relationship with him. God, God held nothing back from us. And so therefore we should hold nothing back from God. But there's another reason we should love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. I want you to listen to what Jesus said elsewhere in the Bible. This would be Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus said this. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. In other words, Jesus was saying there's only room on the throne of your heart for one God. And on the throne of your heart, there's either going to be the big G God or a little G God. 
You've only got room on, on, on the throne of your heart for, for one person. You're either going to serve the one true God or you're going to settle for a false God. But if you settle for a false God, then you're going to end up pushing out the one who created you and wants to bless you. And ultimately, you will end up with a broken life. You'll, you'll be separated from God. So, so how can we help our kids love God more than anyone else? Well, we pray for them, but more importantly, we must show them our love for God. As I was uh, preparing for this message, I found an article that talked about eight different styles of parenting. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to mention, I'll spare you, I'm not going to mention all, all eight different styles of parenting that are out there. Just trust me, there are eight, okay? But there was one that caught my attention, and, and it's called free range parenting. Okay, free, free range parenting. This is the parent who wants to give their children free range. This is the parent that wants to give their kids the freedom to figure out life on their own. And it sounds like such a good idea because we want to teach our kids to be self-reliant. We want to teach our kids to make their own decisions. But the problem with the free range plan is that left to my own devices, I'm not going to choose to love God more. Instead, I'm probably going to choose to love myself more. I'm going to do whatever makes me happy. I'm going to probably do whatever makes me feel good. And in the end, I'm going to be the one that's sitting on the throne of my heart. That's why the best thing that you can do for your children as a parent is to model your love for God to them. P parents, every single one of us, we, we must love God with all of our heart. We must love God with all of our soul. We must love God with all of our mind. And as we show our love for God, our kids will learn to love God the same way that we do. Which, which leads to the second goal I have for my kids. My prayer is that each one of them would have the confidence to move out and live on their own. <laughs> That's my prayer, that they would have the confidence to move out and live on their own. Now, I'll be honest with you, uh, as a parent, I don't really want to push my kids out of the nest, okay? I know birds do that, but I, I don't really want to do that. I don't really want to push them out of the nest at this point in their life. I mean, I, I kind of like having them around. I like getting to spend time with them. They, they bring a, a lot of joy to me. Pl plus, at this stage, we want to help them as much as we possibly can. And so we've told our kids, as long as they are in school, as long as they're in college, that, that they can hang out with us. They, they can live at our house. They can eat our food. They can, they can use our electricity, you know, watch Netflix, all this. They, as long as they're in school. That, that said, at some point, we do want them to move out on their own. I mean, at, at some point, I want them to have enough confidence in themselves and I want them to have enough confidence in God to leave the house and become successful adults. And just so you know, that's God's goal for your kids as well. I want you to check out Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. It says this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Notice the word go, right? We, we want our kids to go eventually, right? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the phrase train up comes from the Hebrew word chanak. Everybody say chanak. Gesundheit. That was very good. Okay. That, that, that word kanak, it, it literally means to initiate or to discipline. And normally when we think about discipline, we think about something negative, right? Like we, we, we think about punishment. Uh, uh, we, we think about uh, something, you know, consequences to our kids' actions. But that word kanak is actually a term that refers to a person's palate or the roof of their mouth. So what in the world does, does my child's mouth have to do with discipline? Well, what's interesting to me is that in Jewish culture, it was common for parents to put something sweet in the roof of their children's mouth. And they would do this to initiate a craving to eat. They would, they would put something sweet in their mouth to kind of get them used to eating. And, and so, for example, if I wanted my child to eat broccoli, because I know broccoli is good for them, but, but they didn't want to eat broccoli because they didn't like the way that broccoli would taste, I, I would take a little bit of honey I would put it in their mouth, which would initiate a craving for more. And then while they're wanting more, I would shove the broccoli in. OK, <laughs> so, so we're training them to crave what's good for them. 
And, and just so you know, this isn't negative reinforcement, okay? This isn't about control and punishment. Instead, this is positive reinforcement, all right? This, this is about training our children in the way that they should go. And the way that they should go is they should eat their veggies. Well, as parents, we have to do the same thing with a lot of different areas in our kids' lives. We have to find positive ways to initiate a craving in their lives for what is true, and for what is good. We have to initiate a craving in their lives for the Word of God and a relationship with God. And, and so as I think about my children, as you think about your children, there's all these different ways that we have to train our kids. We, we have to train our kids to honor God with their money. We have to train our, our kids to look for the right kinds of friends. We have to train our kids to guard their minds and to guard their hearts. We have to train our kids to depend on God in each and every situation. And this is so important for all parents because if we don't train them, if, if we don't train our kids, the world will. So how, how do we train our kids? Well, the methods will change as, as our kids change. You know, when they're toddlers, it's different than when they're little ones. It's different than when they're adolescents, teenagers, young adults. We use different methods. But most often, the way that we train our children is through ongoing conversations. We, we are constantly looking for teachable moments that we can point them to God's word and that we can train them in the way that they should go. I could, I could illustrate it this way. This past summer, my, my son Griffin uh, was able to work at a Christian youth camp in Arkansas, uh, which is really odd to me because most, most camps in Texas were shut down uh, due to the coronavirus, but, but apparently COVID-19 doesn't exist in Arkansas, okay? So, <laughs> so he was able to go, and, and actually he was able to spend the entire summer uh, working at a youth camp. None of the kids got the virus, and so it, it was all good. But as a parent, I was just so excited that he got to go to this camp. I was, I was so excited that he got to experience, you know, working all summer long. First of all, I was excited because he wasn't going to be spending all summer on my couch. You know what I mean? Like e eating my food and watching TV. I mean, so I was, I was excited about that, but I was also excited because this was the first time that he has had a real job. This is the first real job that he's ever had in his life. I mean, with hours and responsibilities and deadlines, this is the first time he had a, a real job and he was going to get a real paycheck and everything. And so after the first week, I, I called him to find out how he was doing, just make sure that things were going well at the camp. And, and of course he said, yeah, things were going well, but the more we talked, the more he began to share with me until finally he told me that that past week, uh, he got called in. His, he and his entire team got called in because they weren't doing exactly what the director of the camp needed them to do. Now, at first, I was a little bit worried about how Griffin might react, you know, about how he might respond to this kind of constructive criticism. But then I saw this as a teachable moment in his life. And so this is what I said to Griffin. I said, Griffin, that conversation that you had with the director of the camp was probably the best thing that could have happened to you this summer. The, the, the reason it's probably the best thing that could have happened to you is because this is training for real life. This is training to be adult because as adults, all of us have to learn how to manage our time. All of us have to be able to take direction. All of us have to learn how to make the boss happy. And so you can either let that conversation make you bitter or you can let that conversation make you better. But, but the choice is up to you. And I'm so proud to say that he actually used that conversation in week one as an opportunity to get better. And I think he had a really great summer. And I think he did really well at his job. But my point is, just like Griffin needed training to be a better employee at camp, all of our kids need training to have the confidence to move out and to trust God and to live life on their own. And so we've got to take advantage of all those opportunities to train our kids in the way they should go, which leads me to one final goal I have for my kids, one final prayer that I pray over them, and that would be this. My goal is that my kids would pursue God's will for their life over their own heart's desire. My, my, my goal, my prayer is that my kids would pursue God's will for their life over their own heart's desire. You know, one of the benefits of living in a country like the United States 
is that there really are so many great opportunities for people to become whatever they want to become. I mean, if you want to become a doctor, you can become a doctor. If you want to work for a company that sends rockets to Mars, you can work for a company that sends rockets to Mars. If you want to start your own restaurant that serves the best fajitas in the world, I wish you would start that restaurant in my neighborhood as soon as possible because I've been craving fajitas lately. But because there are so many opportunities for our kids, as parents, one of the things that we often tell them is that you can and should follow your dreams. You, you can and should do whatever it is that you want to do. And this really sounds like great advice. You know, it sounds like something positive that we can tell our kids because if they can find something they truly love doing and if they can find somebody who will pay them to do that thing, then they will ha- never have to work a day in their life. But, but as Christ followers, I think that there is something better that we can tell our kids. So, so, so instead of telling our kids, you can do whatever you want, what if we told them, you can do whatever God wants. After all, he is the one who created you. He is the one who has gifted you. He is the one who has good works planned for you. And so when our kids get old enough to begin thinking about a career or thinking about what they want to do with their life, something that we should say to them is, it's okay to dream, but just be sure to include God in your planning. Because God may have a completely different plan for you than you have for yourself. In fact, it reminds me of a passage found in Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 57. It says this, it says, As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. That, that, sounds, that sounds like a pretty good plan, right? Like, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. Jesus said to another person, come follow me. The man agreed. Again, that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? The man agreed, but then he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Then another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. Again, that that sounds good, doesn't it? I want to follow Jesus. I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, hopefully you picked up on this, but Jesus is using very strong language in this passage. Jesus meets three different people. They each say that they want to follow him, but when it comes time to actually head out on the road, all of them have one excuse after the other. The first person says, Jesus, I want to follow you just as long as I have a nice house to live in. I mean, as long as I got a nice place to stay, I'll follow you anytime. The second person says, I will follow you, but, but now's not really a good time. It's not very convenient. I've got some stuff that I need to take care of. And then finally, the third person says, Jesus, I want to follow you too, but my family really needs me right now. And so someday, someday I'll get around to it, but right now I'm just too busy. And Jesus responds to these three people in a way that we might never expect. Instead of being gracious, instead of being loving, instead of being compassionate, Jesus basically says, I don't know what you think you signed up for here. I mean, I'm I'm paraphrasing Jesus, okay? I don't don't know know if you realize what you signed up for here, but there's no room in the kingdom of God for people who say they want to follow me, but don't really mean they want to follow me. You see, to follow me means that you must be ready and willing to pursue God's will above your own desires. I don't know if you've uh, noticed this, realized this, but the world has radically changed over the past six months, hasn't it? I know when the coronavirus first hit, I, I thought, like all of you probably thought, that all of this is going to be over in a couple of weeks, and at that point we will just get back to Normal, But can we agree at this point that normal flew out the window a long time ago? I'm not, I'm not even sure we're ever going to get back to normal, whatever, whatever normal means, or at least it's going to be a long time before we do. 
Now, I'm not saying that God can't turn this whole pandemic around overnight. I believe with all my heart that God is still on the throne and he will continue to care for his people. But I also believe that what the world needs right now is a miracle. What, what the world needs right now is a church that's ready to follow God with all their heart, soul, and mind. What, what the world needs now is a generation of middle schoolers a generation of high schoolers, a generation of college students who make the decision to follow God's will rather than their own heart's desire. And I believe that we would see kids who will do that. We're, we're, we're possibly going to lose an entire generation here, but I believe that we can turn it around, that God can turn it around if we will just begin to pray a simple prayer over our children's lives. God, God may our kids become more like your son. God, may our kids grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God. Amen. As we close, I want to pray. I want to, I want to pray for our students that are getting ready to go back to school. I want to pray for our, our parents and for our teachers who are going to have to guide them through this process. And so right now, I just want you to bow your heads right where you're at. And I want you to pray along with me. But, but, but let's go to God. Dear God in heaven, we just come to you recognizing that as parents there is so much that we don't understand when it comes to raising kids but what we do understand is that we cannot do it without you and so I pray for our parents I pray that each one of them would become the spiritual leaders in their homes the the spiritual leaders that you want them to be and I pray that your love and that your power would anoint every household, whether it be married or, or single or blended family. I pray that, that, that we would be able to show our children our love for you in a way that makes them want to fall in love with you as well. God, I pray that our spiritual leadership would just become a natural reflection of what you are doing in our lives. And for our kids, God, I pray that you would renew their minds, that, that they would not put you... Uh, second or third or fourth or fifth, but that they would put you first and that they would seek you with all of their hearts. God, I, I pray that they would fully surrender to you. And as they do, I pray that you would anoint them to lead this country and lead this world back to you. I pray that as a new school year begins, that you would give parents the wisdom and strength and energy they need to be both parent and teacher. I pray for the teachers who are trying to impart knowledge to the virtual classroom. God, I just pray that you would help them not to get frustrated and to continue to find solutions for this unprecedented problem that we're all facing together. God, most of all, I'm just going to pray for a vaccine to the coronavirus. And I pray that all of us would recognize what we really need is more of you. God, we thank you in advance for what you're doing through this generation. It's the name of Jesus that I pray and ask all of these things. Amen. As always, we never want to close out a service without giving you the opportunity to make Jesus your Lord and Savior and friend. And so if you're listening today and, and you've been doing things on your own or, or maybe you haven't been putting God first, maybe he's coming in second place or third place or fourth place. Hey, listen, we, 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 want to, we want to talk to you. We want to give you the opportunity to reach out to us. And so if you would, just go to our connection card on our website. And uh, underneath Next Steps, you can just check off that box that says Re- Receive Christ. Or if you need prayer, you can just write out your prayer to us. And we'll be getting back in touch with you this week. At this time, we do have a couple of questions that I'm going to encourage you to talk over with those who may be watching with you. These are pretty broad. They're pretty generic. And so it doesn't matter if you have kids or not. These are two really great questions I think all of you can talk through. Here they are as we put them on the screen. Uh, Number one, how has parenting changed in the year 2020? It has definitely changed. But how has parenting changed in the year 2020? And then question number two, how can you pray for our parents, students, and teachers this school year? Well, once again, we're certainly glad that you tuned in with us. I hope that you've been blessed as we have gone through this study, my favorite verse. And I'm going to be praying for all of our parents, all of our students, all of our teachers this year. God bless.